So I was a first-year grad student, and I was living in Chicago, going to Trinity International University, um, and I showed up there. It was around this time of year. It was the beginning of July, and I was going there early because I was taking a summer course. I had to take a summer course before I could officially enter into my program, and so I said, I'll go do that in the summer instead of like making it a part of my degree in the fall. And so I show up to campus, uh, drove out here from New Hampshire with my dad. It was around 4th of July weekend. We spent 4th of July here, and then he left, dropped me off on campus at my on-campus house, a housing space, and then he left. And I was living in a dorm at the time, just an on-campus dorm. And what I realized real quickly is that there's no one on campus in the summer. I felt like I was the only student living there, and there was also like no food being served on campus. So I'm living in a dorm. I'm just on my own for the first time, and I'm like, how do I take care of myself and feed myself as a single guy living in a dorm when the only thing I have is a microwave? So I go down the corner or down the street to the grocery store that's just right around the corner, and I'm wandering the grocery store, like, n having no idea what to do, like, just pushing a cart, thinking, like, oh, maybe I'll get some of this, maybe I'll get some of that, and it, like, the idea pops in my head, well, maybe, like, a frozen meal, like, maybe a frozen dinner would be the thing that I should get, and so I'm 22 years old, I go to the frozen food, and I just start, like, loading these frozen foods and these frozen meals into my cart, and I go check out, I go back to my dorm room. And I got one that looks like this. And um, I pulled it out of the box, and I was like instantly starting to regret my decisions. But I was like, I, like what am I going to do? I just went and spent all my money on these, so I, I guess I got to eat them. And I, like, I poked the holes in the little plastic top, and I put it in the microwave, and I'm just like watching the thing spin and just waiting for the thing to ding. And then I pull it out, and I pull back the plastic and it steams up and I'm just staring down at my dinner and it's like this gooey, steamy mess. And I'm like, oh, maybe this was a bad idea. And I go and I take one bite and it confirmed, that one bite confirmed that it was in fact a bad idea. And I thought about like pitching the whole thing, but I'm also a poor grad student. I don't have a whole lot of money. And so I like choke the thing down and think to myself, I've got to figure out a different way to feed myself than living off of these for a whole summer. And I wonder if anybody's ever been there before. Like, you're just in that season of life, you're in that space of life where you're like, you're broke, you don't have a whole lot, like, life is not convenient, and you're just like, this is what my life is like. Uh, there's this guy, his name is Sir Sir Lee, Sir Sir Lee. He is a professional chef in Toronto. He's been on Iron Chef. He has two restaurants in Toronto, and he has a YouTube channel with his son called the Iron Chef Dad. And basically, his son is filming him uh, doing different things with food. Sometimes he's introducing him to new food. Sometimes they're making unique things. And sometimes he gives him these food challenges, like, can you create something gourmet out of this. He's been on Iron Chef a bunch, won a bunch of chef awards. He's like a top-notch chef. And so one of the challenges that he does with his dad on his YouTube channel is he gives him a frozen meal, and he says, can you take this frozen meal, something that looks like this, and turn it into something gourmet? And through the eight-minute video, he goes step-by-step, step, and he takes something that looks like this, and he turns it into this. It's this like beautiful gourmet meal. He takes the corn and he takes the potatoes and somehow he makes cornbread out of them. And then he takes the little like rib steak thing, chops it up, recooks it, takes the sauce and creates a new glaze and then like puts it all together and his son tastes it and he's like, this is amazing. And sometimes I wonder if we find ourselves in places in life where we look at something like a frozen meal, and you're like, that's my life. Like, it's this hot mess of a meal. Like, when it comes out of the microwave, and it's steamy, and it's bubbly, and it's gooey, and it doesn't look appetizing, sometimes we feel like our life is like that. In the seasons of life where maybe you're actually eating those things, you think to yourself, like, how did I get here? And the thing we want to know in those moments when our life seems unappetizing, it's uninspiring, it feels like it's just down and out, we wonder to ourselves, like, can anything good come out of my life? We want to know, can, can something in this moment be transformed 
to something great because it feels like it's impossible. It feels like this is the rest of my life. And sometimes we wonder, can anything good come out of the mess that my life is in? And if you're here this morning, I think baptisms are a beautiful reminder that God's not finished with you yet, that there is still more to come your way. And what we've been exploring through the book of John is that Jesus also is calling you to a place where he's saying to you, there is more for you. And our passage today highlights the ultimate end for what Jesus has for us. No matter where we find ourselves, if we respond to his call to follow him. And this is where our passage today, this is John chapter 8, starting in verse 48, we read this. It says, the Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Now, the majority of chapter 7 and chapter 8 is one scene that spans a few days. And Jesus, in this one scene, is in Jerusalem and he's teaching in the temple. And the reason Jesus is in the temple and the reason he's in Jerusalem is because the Jews are celebrating the Festival of Tabernacles. It's this annual festival that remembers God's redemption of his people from slavery in Egypt thousands of years ago, and it celebrates the supernatural provision that God gave his people as they wandered through the desert to make their way to the promised land, and how God still is providing for his people. Now, you might anticipate, because it's a festival, because it's a time of celebration, and Jesus is teaching in the temple that the mood in the temple would be joyful and exciting, when in reality, the mood in the temple is tense, because Jesus finds himself in a situation with the crowds listening to him, where they're confused by what he's saying, they disagree with what he's saying, and it's really contentious and stressed. And right before our passage today, Jesus has just called the Jews in front of him, children of the devil. Maybe one of the harshest things that Jesus ever says to anybody in the Gospels. And so they fire back saying, well, aren't you a Samaritan? Right? Samaritans were enemies of the Jews. Essentially, aren't you a traitor? Aren't you not really a Jew? And maybe you're demon-possessed, meaning you're out of your mind. You were just so far gone. To which Jesus then responds in verse 49. I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Basically, Jesus is saying, I'm just trying to bring honor and glory to God. He has sent me to do that, and I'm trying to help people avoid the judgment that is coming. God is the judge, and there is going to be a time when he judges the earth, and I'm helping people avoid that judgment, which will ultimately result in death. And then he continues saying this in verse 51, Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. To which the crowd responds, Well, now we know you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Essentially, they're saying everyone dies. There has never been a person who has not died. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets, saying not even the greatest heroes of our faith have been able to avoid death. Jesus, what in the world are you saying? And then the response to him is the question, the question of all the questions. Who do you think you are? are? That's the question. It is the question of all questions. It's the question that chapter 7 and chapter 8 have been circling the entire time. It's the question that John, in writing his story about Jesus, set out to answer from the beginning. It is the question for all of humanity in all seasons and all stages and all generations of life. Who do you think you are? And if Jesus is who he says he is, he is either a dangerous charlatan, somebody who's trying to pull the biggest 
trick, the biggest wool over anybody's eyes in all of history. He's either deceptive and a deceiver, or he is a certified crazy man. Because Jesus didn't come just to be a nice guy. He didn't come to be a nice moral teacher. And if Jesus isn't who he says he is, he's either a dangerous charlatan or certified crazy, and he should be avoided at all costs. But if he is who he says he is, he is Lord of lords and King of kings. He he is the sustainer of all life. He is the one who put everything into motion. He holds the world in the palm of his hands, and what that means is that he has the ability to take what might seem like a mess of your life and make it new. Even when it seems impossible, even when it seems that you have lost all hope, if Jesus is who he says he is, he is the one who can change your life even when you feel like there is no way possible. And he goes on to say, it's what he's getting at in his next response. He says this in 54, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. He's basically saying, I'm telling the truth. Like, I'm not a con artist. I'm not a crazy man. I'm sent from God to tell you the truth. And he says, I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, that last line confuses the crowds greatly. Like, everything through chapter 7 and chapter 8 has been continually confusing the crowds, and they keep firing questions back to Jesus, trying to get clarity to figure out what in the world Jesus is saying. Because they respond in verse 57, you're not even 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Essentially, how is that possible? How do you know what Abraham would think? I mean, he was alive thousands of years ago. You're barely 30. How in the world can you say you've seen him, he's seen your day, and you know what he would think? And then Jesus says this in verse 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered. This is his mic drop moment in the first half of John's gospel. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. And the Jews are furious. It says that they pick up stones. They're ready to kill him. They're ready to execute him on the spot because they know exactly what he's saying. Now, to us, this might seem like a little insignificant of a statement to say, I am. And we might even say, Jesus, hey, that's not correct grammar, right? Because he's talking about Abraham in the past tense, right? He's saying, before Abraham was speaking of the past, and then he jumps to the present, I am. We might anticipate that what he's trying to say is, before Abraham was, I existed before him, going further in the past. But what he's doing here is he's calling on a wildly significant phrase for the Jews. It's a phrase that God used in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, to introduce himself. It's the first time that God personally introduces himself to anybody in the scriptures. And it's when Moses is hanging around the burning bush, and God's calling him to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. And he's calling him to go to the Egyptians and redeem and release the people. And he's like, well, well hey, wh- what if they, they ask me, well, who sent me? Like, because here I am, this old guy just shows up to Egypt. Hey, let the Jews go. Who are you and who sent you? God says to him, tell them, I am sent you. It becomes this way for the Jewish people to say, like, God has always been. God has always existed. There has never been a time in history when God has not existed. And the simplest way to name what that means is I am. From his standpoint, I am. He is He always has been, he always is, he always will be. And Jesus in this moment is declaring, not mincing words at all, 
I am God. If you're tracking through chapter 7 and chapter 8, the whole thing is leading up to this moment where John is trying to say in the plainest terms possible, Jesus is God. Jesus is King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He holds all things together. It says in Hebrews 1, just by his powerful word, he's sustaining all of life. First, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1 it says, all things were created by him, through him, and for him. He is the supreme one over all things. Jesus is God, which has two major implications for our life, especially if we're in a place, in a moment, in a season where we want to change and we want things to be different and it seems impossible, the first thing is, the first implication is that Jesus has the power. Jesus has the power. Now, throughout John's gospel, there's lots of themes that run through the gospel like a thread connecting it all together. They surface in chapter 1 and they kind of run all the way through the end. Two of those themes we see here in this moment. The first one is glory. Glory pops on the page in chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us in chapter 1, and we have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only, sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. So glory starts in chapter 1, this theme of glory. It runs through the whole book, and you see it surface again here because Jesus, in this passage, is talking about how he has come to bring glory to the Father. And in bringing glory to the Father, the Father actually glorifies himself. You see it at the beginning of this whole speech in chapter 7. Jesus talks again about bringing glory to the Father. But the unique thing about glory as it's perceived in the scriptures, is that glory is not just meant for God. We think of glorifying God, our job is to bring glory to Him, but it's not just that we are called to bring glory to God. In the same way that Jesus glorifies the Father, and the Father in turn glorifies the Son, the same is true of us. We are called to glorify God with our lives, but because of what's true of Jesus is also true of us, God seeks to glorify us as well. It says in Romans 8 that we are destined to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus for those who have put their faith in Him. And it says, those He called, He justified. And those He justified, speaking of us, He also glorified. C.S. Lewis has this really well-known sermon called The Weight of Glory, where he kind of compares the notion of glory to that of beauty. And there's this wonderful spot in the sermon where he says, you know, it's not just that we, as humans, want to see beauty. Although sometimes just seeing beauty is wonderful enough. What we really want is to somehow be united with the beauty that we see. Have you ever been so overcome by something beautiful that you're just like, like, somehow I need to be a part of that. I need that thing to be a part of me. It seems almost awkward to talk about that at times, but there's something about beauty that we just want to overwhelm us. I can remember, um, it was years ago, I was sitting in my office, um, and this was like when Pandora music was a big thing. Like, anybody still listen to Pandora? Oh, we got some, like, you're probably over 50 years old (laughs) if you still use Pandora. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Younger generations are like, I never heard of that before. But I'm listening to Pandora, and uh, this song comes on by Nickel Creek called Doubting Thomas. And I'm like just typing away, doing email, and it just stopped me from what I was doing. And I was just so overcome by the music. I literally, like, pushed back from my desk. I kicked my feet up on the desk. I'm like, I just need this song to like wash over me because it was so breathtakingly beautiful. When we see beauty and we're captivated by it, somehow we want to participate in it. And when we see Jesus not only as youthful, useful in washing away our sins, but when we see him as beautiful, 
as glorified, magnificent, and overwhelming. We want to be a part of his life, and that's what God is trying to do with us. As we enter the waters of baptism, it's trying to participate in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus because he is the one who has the power. Specifically, he has the power to turn our shame into glory. We all carry shame. We all carry hidden things in our life. And when we surrender them to Jesus... He has the ability to wash them away and glorify us so that we are more and more conformed to the likeness of him. There's a theme of glory that runs through the gospel of John. The other theme that runs through the gospel of John that we see in chapter 1 and surfaces here is that of life. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God in the beginning, and in him was life. Jesus is the source of life. So not only does Jesus have power, Jesus is the source. And in chapter 7 and chapter 8, you see this theme of life start to surface, but you actually see it from the reverse side, meaning you see repeatedly the the notion and the theme of death and dying through chapter 7 and chapter 8. It starts with Jesus confronting the Jews, hey, why are you trying to kill me? And then the Jews somewhere along the way listen to Jesus teach, and he says, where I'm going, you cannot follow. Where I'm going, you cannot find. You will look for me, and you won't be able to find me. And they say, is he going to kill himself? And then Jesus starts to tell them, hey, you, in fact, are going to be the ones who die. You are going to die in your sins. And then in the previous passage, he says, there's Satan, who you are the children of the devil, and he is a murderer and has been a murderer from the beginning. There's this theme of death, which is the opposite of life. And what Jesus is trying to get to here, he says, those who come to me will never taste, never see. They will never die. Why? Because I am the source of life. Now, we all will physically die. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has the power to bring life out of death. He has the power to bring life out of death. So even though we physically die, spiritually we live forever. And there will be a great resurrection at the end of time where all who have gone uh, passed away before us will be raised to everlasting life. And for those who follow Jesus in the here and now, we have the ability to take hold of that everlasting life today. It's not just a quantity of life, but it's a quality of life, and it's a life that has the power to change all of what you experience in the here and now. And so the question is how? Like, like, how does that happen? If Jesus is God, if he has the power, if he is the source, like, how is it that I take hold of that so that I see that transformation happen in my life? Well, Jesus says two things in this passage. The first is he says to the crowds, like, I know him. Speaking of the Father, like, I, I know him. Do you guys remember the movie Elf? Buddy the Elf comes to New York City He's in the department store, and the guy who's the manager, like they're decorating for Christmas, and he just like busts in, hey, tomorrow, 10 a.m., Santa's coming. And what does Buddy the Elf do? do? He goes, Santa! And he's like running around so excited, and he says to one of the workers, I know him. I know him. Like naively foolish. I know him. I mean, the call of the Christian faith is to know God in the same way that Buddy the Elf knows Santa, and have that same naive enthusiasm about the joy of the Lord being deeply ingrained in you. You're like, I I know the God of the universe who created all things, who holds all things together. Like, I know Him. I have the, the ability to speak to Him Like, he hears the things that I say, and he actually speaks back to me. Like, I know God. Like, we take that for granted. What an amazing reality. And then Jesus says, I know him, and I obey 
his word. And it's not just this rote obedience, like i got to follow the rules so God doesn't get mad at me. He's designed life to work in a certain way. And when I follow his design for life, like I experience joy. I experience delight. I experience his goodness and his glory, and it comes back to me. And I get to experience life the way, in, in the here and now, in, in glimpses, because the world is broken. I get to experience life the way that God hoped it would be. And so all this is this morning is one big invitation to come to Jesus. Because Jesus is God. He has the power to change your life. He has the power to rewrite your story. And the Jews in chapter 8 miss it. They don't see it. It goes right over their heads. But that same invitation that he gave to them on that day that they missed, still stands today. That if you're somebody who is in need of a fresh start, if you're in a situation that you feel like all hope is gone, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm God. I have come. I have the power to change your life. I am the source of life. So come to me to see what it is I can do for you. So may you see that Jesus is God, that he is the great I am. May you know that in him is true life, the life that is truly life. And may you believe that he has the power to transform yours. Lord, we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. We thank you so much for what baptism symbolizes that you take things that are broken, that you take things that are not working, that you think you take things that, that are dead and you restore them. You put them back together. You bring them back to life. Lord, may we never, never lose sight of the power that is found in you. May we trust that you are the source and may we run to you continually, daily, knowing and believing that you are good, you desire good for us, and you are seeking to make all things new, including us. We love you, Lord, and pray this in your name. Amen.